How do you think I'm going to stand? Do you think I can stand up to Obama? Yes. I think so. I think I might have that opportunity. We have the ability to filibuster with 42. If I don't go, we're down to one vote. And you know that tricky Olympia Snow. She's always on the other side. And there's another couple too. That'll stop. That'll stop. And that's why it's so important, this election, for West Virginia and for the United States. But what can we do? Do you all realize that our country has more petroleum than any country in the world times two. Times two. We have twice. Now, we are the only country, Jim, that by law keeps their natural resources in the ground. That's it. Only country. Only country that keeps it in the ground by law. Can you imagine this? Let's look, let's look at another scenario. What can we do to rejuvenate General Motors? Does anybody have a good guess in the room? Let me just throw that to the floor. Obama out. <laughs> Obama gone. Because we need the government out of that. That is a message to the world that we're back. That's a message to Chrysler that we're coming next and removing government from that scenario. Because the private sector creates jobs in this country, the private sector fuels this country, and capitalism makes it work. Remember that government has no money. They have your money. You don't know anything about building a car, and I don't know anything about building a car, but I can tell you one thing, I do a lot of business in Michigan, and I know a lot of people in Michigan that know a lot about building an automobile instead of a Barack Obama mobile. A lot of people. We have the greatest industrialization in the world and we're not using it. We have what is called an industrial coma. And we are in, in an industrial coma. What does that mean? That means the federal government is micromanaging our economy. And when a federal government or state government or government in general micromanages the economy, that is the death of free enterprise. And that's what we have today. How are we going to get out of it? First thing that we're going to do, if I have the opportunity, is I'm going to get like-minded senators together. And it can be done. Democrats and Republicans are conservative that value this country. We're going to take General Motors and Chrysler back the way they should be to the private sector. And then we're going to do something I think is very interesting. We're going to have what is called regulatory reform. What is that? Why are we in the condition we're in? Well, I'm in the coal business, and I can tell you, I burn coal, I mine coal, and I do as what every good corporate citizen in the state of West Virginia. We keep our nose clean, and we do what's right. Now, have you ever been through a permit process in your life? It is not something that you want to do. Number one, it's way too long. Number two, it's way too expensive. Number three, most of the time you don't get the permit. And number four, that commodity sits in the ground. People like to make fun of me. They always say, John Racy millionaire. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I made my money the old-fashioned way. I inherited it, okay? I admit that. I admit that. I inherited a lot of rocks, and those rocks are in the ground. But you know something about rocks in the ground? They're worthless until you bring them out. And worthless until you mine them, and worthless until you bring them to market, worthless until you sell them, and worthless until you bring it together. The biggest impediment that I have in business today is government. That's the biggest impediment. Now, how much regulation do we have in this country? Too much. He said too much. I'll give you an exact figure. $1.2 trillion worth of regulatory nightmare to every American corporation. How about that? In 2008, the United States Congress, the United States Congress gave us 3,800 new regulatory bills alone. And I saw a lot of Republicans and Democrats sitting together smiling while I'm sitting there in utter misery. Utter misery because that's not the ticket to making this country great. Let's lower the regulatory nightmare. Let's create an enterprise zone, an enterprise zone of low taxation, low regulation. 
I compete all around the world. I'm in the steel business, for instance. Do you know what corporate tax is in this country? This is boring stuff, but I want you to know, corporate tax is 35% of the gross. So in other words, they don't even let me make a, an opportunity to make money. They hit me right off the bat, 35%. I can name you 80 countries across the world that have 18% and less. 18% and less. So why can't we get like-minded senators to sit there and go, let's lower the corporate tax structure. Amen. Let's lower it. Yeah. And what happens? You start business moving again because then capitalists and free enterprisers and people that want to make money start making money again. What did Ronald Reagan do in 1982? Okay, he inherits what? Jimmy Carter. Remember Jimmy? Jimmy. He used to come on in those cardigan sweaters. Remember then? I would always feel really cozy and comfortable and be by the, you know, sort of there by the fireplace and he'd start talking about the misery index. Remember that? I never could figure that. Then he had a Malaysia speech. You ever hear what a Malaysia means? I don't really know either. And then uh, he would go in to say that, you know, good Americans should turn the air conditioning down and turn your lights out at night so we could walk around so there wasn't an air raid by the Germans. <laughs> That's not America. That's not America. And Reagan did, and what he did, he came in and he cut the top tax rate, the producers, the people that make jobs, the people that put things together, the risk takers. He cut it from 50 to 28. That's not a Bush tax cut. That's a Reagan tax cut. Amen. And that's the difference. What happened? Well, the economy started to move, and then right in the middle of the movement, we have the air traffic controllers strike. Oh my. 14,000 federal employees said, we're out of here. I'm not working anymore. And Reagan, sort of like Harry Truman, said, well, you know, today's Monday, and Wednesday, you better be back to work. So he gave him Monday, then he gave him Tuesday, and then he gave him Nagasaki. He fired all 14,000, just like Harry Truman did. And then we have a whole new country, didn't we? We're walking, holy mackerel, he canned them. People just don't do things like that. Well, by God, he did. And you know what happened? In 1982, when he did that, the whole country changed. We said, we got a whole new gun in Washington, don't we? and we started to move. And how fast did we move? Well, I can tell you it didn't move as fast as Warren Harding because we listened to a little story about Mr. Wilson earlier today, a progressive. And Mr. Wilson left the White House with 11% unemployment, okay? 11% unemployment. A balanced budget, no, none of that. Big progressive. So when Warren G. Harding went, how many remember Warren G. Harding? 